Hi, I'm Adam. This is Kevin. And we are Tech Guys Who Invest. This is the place for business people and investors to learn all about investing. We offer a fresh perspective on what it's like to have a day job while investing. And we share lessons learned on our investing journey. Our vision is to educate and entertain you while adding tons of value to your daily commute. Welcome to our show. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. Adam and I are educators at heart, which is why we started the podcast, because it's our job to help you understand how to invest wisely and safely. Now, Adam and I primarily invest in real estate. However, there are other avenues that people are using to get financially free. And in this case, we're talking about an investment vehicle known as value investing, which is popularized by a pretty wealthy and famous individual. You might know him. I think his name is Warren Buffett. Anyways, you can look up that person if you don't know who he is. And we speak with Matt Zubricki from Distill Dollar, and he educates us on what value investing is and how you can start value investing in your own life with your own portfolio. So we hope you enjoy the show. And if this is something that you're interested in, please feel free to reach out to us either at Instagram uh, at Tech Guys Who Invest on, uh, you can email us directly, Tech Guys Who Invest at Gmail dot com, or let us know in the comments if you like value investing, if you practice it, what you think of it, how you feel it stands up against real estate. We'd love to hear your thoughts and engage with us. So, without further ado, here is the episode. Matt, thank you so much for being a guest on the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. We're excited to bring you on the show because you're going to talk about investing, but it's not real estate investing as Adam and I are uh, real estate investors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean, I love real estate. I grew up with a lot of real estate in my, my family. Both my parents were brokers, both my brothers are brokers, uh, and they still do uh, a lot of real estate. So I've been exposed to a lot of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, growing up, uh, started learning about something else called value investing. So I know we'll talk a lot more about that. And uh, that's like a huge thing that Warren Buffett's all about. So well, I'm sure we'll have it on this one. But yeah, thanks for having me guys on, on, the, on the show. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you on. Um, so why don't we start with what it is? Uh, value investing, I don't think it's something that is common knowledge among a lot of people who aren't maybe in, in an investor or in that space. So can you tell us what that is for people who may not know? Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, you know, in the simplest terms, it's really just trying to find something that a value investor would say has an intrinsic value above the stock market price, but that might already be overcomplicating it, right? So really it's just kind of finding valuable things in the market that other people aren't seeing as valuable. Um, it's so the analogy that Warren Buffett loves to use, or at least he loved to use for like a good 50 years, was kind of going around finding cigar butts that other people had discarded on the ground and kind of gross, but you know, he was happy to pick them up, get a few free puffs that were 100% free. But, you know, that was how he started building his wealth. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of came out of the, uh, you, know, the, you know, the turn of the century. A lot of companies were these huge industrial companies that had a lot of assets, but they weren't making a lot of money. And so if you just looked at their assets on the book value, you could sort of develop like an intrinsic value based on, you know, if you sold everything. but they would be trading at all these crazy, you know, different multiples and whatever. And, and this guy, Ben Graham, basically lost a lot of money uh, in one of those crashes. So he was like, this is kind of a ridiculous system and basically went to study that for his life, basically. Um, and, and so that's where security analysis comes from. And that's where this whole notion of value investing comes from. Uh, so that's all the early stages of it. <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, that's like yeah. Kind of the, the brief intro is kind of, yeah, find the cigar butts as, as best you can. So it's finding, looking for clues to what makes a company great, if you will, and then kind of, uh, investing in that greatness. Is that right? Or in that value? Uh, well, it's not even, I mean, so if you look at just value investing, it's nothing to do with great companies. It's looking at a price disparity in the market and trying to then, you know, take advantage of the arbitrage and, and that differential. So 
those cigar butts, they're, they're not great, right? They're kind of gross, right? And yeah. so, I mean, sure, you, you might find one where someone only took two puffs for whatever reason, or maybe you might find a full one, right? One day or something. But most of the time, you're going to find disgusting stuff. So for Buffett's case, you know, big transformation for his investing game. And I think a lot of people kind of equate this with value investing. He got turned on by this guy, uh, Fisher, who said it's better to buy a just want to make sure I get the quote right. Uh, it's better to buy a good company at a fair price than a fair company at a good price. Yeah, I've heard that. And so he had to instill that belief into, into Warren Buffett, who was of the mentality of, I don't want to buy good companies. I want to buy the fair companies that still have that cigar butt mentality. So he was buying and selling all these different things, these securities. So that was kind of the shift to the start of basically Berkshire Hathaway, right? This conglomerate now of all these different pieces now coming together. Yeah. That's all these good companies, you know, instead of these fair companies, he would just pick up and discard. It is interesting. Um, so again, back to some people who still may not quite um, fully understand this, you are talking about investing in companies and I assume you're talking about, stocks right absolutely so you know warren's a big equity investor and at the end of the day a stock is a slice of a company Mm -hmm. so you know he's always trying to get you know nowadays he's got so much cash that yeah he's got to buy pretty much the whole company with that much cash um you know if he he buys a a billion dollar company it really doesn't move the needle anymore but but yeah back in the day he was buying you know he, would, he like an early stock, for example, was uh, government employees insurance company, um, which is Geico, right? So it was an insurance company that only insured government employees, and statistically, it actually had a uh, you know basically a safer rate of drivers and you know less rates of accidents. But the banks were treating them uh, essentially the same. So like basically saw this like price disparity sort of like walked into to the, the CEO's office at like the age 24 hot check kid. And just, yeah, he, he's trying to understand the business at the end of the day. And that's what, again, value investing goes back to is trying to find that intrinsic value of what's the business worth. Not, not what, what's a product worth or, you know, what does management think it's worth, but it's, you know, trying to find that overall value. And how is this, value assessed or calculated? I know you're talking about intrinsic value, uh, but have you ever read anything or from your knowledge that states, I, it's probably not as straightforward as this, but X, A plus B equals C type of thing you should have. Oh yeah, in. there's tons of that stuff. So uh, security analysis is like a book like this big and basically Ben Graham goes through dozens of companies doing this analysis but all these companies are like old, like railroad companies and it's pretty simple. So, you know, nowadays you're talking a lot of, you know, I mean, a year ago, everyone was talking about Bitcoin and nowadays it's all these tech stocks. So it's, it's a little trickier nowadays, but, uh, but yeah, I would say um, in terms of the formula, um, you know, value investors look for essentially a company with a, a stable moat, around it that's like an analogy they often use you know basically a durable competitive advantage um you know probably the biggest mode example out there is coca-cola right so you can have a great cola company out there but there's just something about the taste of coca-cola it's nostalgic and people want to keep buying it um so that's why i mean that's why warren invested you know billions of dollars in coca-cola right so um yeah it's kind of finding those companies with that durable competitive advantage and this way the reason why you look for that is it gives you a little bit more security when you forecast the earnings right and that's basically what it comes down to you're looking at a company's earnings and if they're you know if you're investing a dollar and you make 10 cents on that dollar but it's growing at 10 percent per year but it's been doing that for 10 years you know straight that's like the type of company that Warren would go in after. But if it's a tech company that's up and down, you know, year over year growth, 
it's hard to predict that. So value investors look for that predictable value stream and they really look at earnings in a lot of ways. Um, and they look for those upward trends, whether it be on earnings or within a certain market. And I can go on and on, but yeah, that's kind of like the, the, the answer there. So Matt, what, what kind of things do you do to analyze these? And, you know, I'm not asking for your specific formulas or, or things like that. I'm, I guess I'm asking at a little bit higher level, like for example, with real estate, uh, you know, we will, we have certain steps we'll take to analyze a property and, you know, we may use a spreadsheet tool that'll help us understand the, the rents coming in and the expenses and all of the anticipated, um, repairs that we'll do to as part of our plan that that's an example of how we might look at it how does a value investor analyze deals or or potential stocks yeah i mean uh i mean most value investors would love to be in the position of of you know being able to influence control over a company and buy a large enough you know share of the stock to to yeah, make the market realize, hey, there is some intrinsic value here that's not being uh, understood by the market, essentially, right? Um, but uh, you know, I would say most of the time they, they kind of look at it like, um, yeah, I mean that's, that's a really good question because I'm just thinking about like you know, depending on the value investor, um, there's a few famous ones. And I think the term kind of gets thrown around, so it's kind of hard to to really pinpoint it. But if you look at someone like, you know, just using the Warren Buffett analogy again, you know, he doesn't have a calculator, for example. He's never used a calculator because, and he doesn't like Greek, you know, letters. <laughs> <laughs> like alphas. If math, or any- yeah. If the math gets that complex, then it's not a good deal. That's what he thinks. Right? Interesting. So he wants it to be like, you know, paper, you know, back of the napkin type of math. And do you subscribe to that? Well, I believe that if you need to know the business, right, that's really what he's getting at. Okay. And, you know, it's like when you get into like Greek formulas, I think it it gets more into predicting uh, predictions and things like that. So a value investor like Buffett takes a big leap when he's assuming those earnings are coming in. but. you know, that's again, assuming the intrinsic value is there, but, um, you know, going back to kind of like the, the, the formula for it, like basically there's a lot of ratios you look at, you know, from, for cash to debt, you know, earnings to sales, there's a lot of ratios that you can, yeah, you can plug and chug and compare them to other companies within the sector. And maybe there's a, you know, one company that's trading at a multiple of earnings. that's much lower than the rest. You know, it's a very common kind of value investor play. Um, <clears throat> the reason being that, you know, if all things are equal, all companies should be trading at the same multiple earnings. But, you know, if one's lower, maybe it's because they got some bad press. You know, um, this happens all the time. And, you know, people like Warren love to take advantage of it. And that's where that quote comes from, where when others are fearful, be greedy. And when others are greedy, be fearful. Um, because he loves to hear that bad news in the press. He loves to buy that on the dip because, you know, that doesn't change the company's intrinsic value overnight. But uh, going back to, yeah, what would they do? I mean, looking at like something personally, what I would do, I would just go straight to the, you know, the 10 Ks at the end of the day uh, as a CPA, I would just look at the balance sheet. I mean, just really fundamentals income statement, like, you know, profit loss, and then, you know, basically just understand management. That's the most, that's the most direct report you're going to get. It's an annual summary. And just if you read 10 years of those, you'll understand a company better than any news article or, or book or digest will ever, will ever tell you because it's just black and white numbers and it's, it's concrete. Okay. I love that. There is a ton of uh, nuggets there you, you dropped on us, uh, but I wanted to draw this parallel and I want to make sure I understand it. So with real estate, Adam and I are both problem solvers. What we like to think of ourselves, we look for opportunities where there's a problem to be solved, where we can add value. That way, the, there's already some uh, risk mitigation within that. If I understand correctly, from Warren Buffett's standpoint, he's looking at a company and he'll do a tremendous amount of research on that company, maybe the industry as a whole as well, to understand, wait, why is this company so much lower than its next competitor? 
goes in, understands, hey, it looks like this year they got bad press and it's just on a decrease. We can come in, maybe change management. Is that the same thought process? Yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, he doesn't like to technically come in and change management. He like he actually likes to do the opposite, where he loves to buy a company and don't do anything. Let them run it just like they're running it. And he just loves to just get that dividend check, you know? Um, and that's that's what he means by finding a company with, you know, good good management. You know, he loves to find those family-owned or those family culture kind of companies that, that fit into the Berkshire family. Um and yeah, if you ever, you know, we did the, the Berkshire uh, Sheryl's meeting was just uh, earlier this month. But if you guys ever get a chance to go out to Omaha, um, <laughs> it's a it's a it's like the Woodstock of capitalism. Right. And uh, you get you see all these brands that he's acquired over the years. And, um, you know, it's like something like 50, 60 companies plus, you know, huge investments into, you know, IBM, Coca-Cola, Apple now. And um it's yeah, it's just uh, quite quite remarkable what he what he what he's built up. But uh, you know, for for most value investors, yeah, they're you know they're they're really looking to you know look for that one or two active plays. And I would say the hardest part with being an act uh, you know a value investor is you have to basically trust that the rest of the market's going to pick up and follow what you saw earlier. Um, which can be extremely difficult because, you know, if, if you study value investing long enough, it's like you, you, st- you start to be introduced to these topics that Ben Graham talks about, like Mr. Market and the margin of error, which were two famous, you know, principles that he brought up in his book, uh, The Intelligent Investor. Um, and that's, you know, but, you know, Warren Buffett all the time says that's his favorite investing book and he learned so much from it. But it gets this idea that, you know, even if you can find the value at the end of the day, the market's kind of that manic polar, you know, bipolar kind of up and down swing based on the emotions. So, you know, if you can weather the storms long enough over 10, 20, 30 years, he says that, you know, the price will level out, but um, that's why value investing is just really hard. It's a hard game to play. Yeah, Kevin, I'm uh, I'm smelling a Tech Guys Who Invest episode being broadcast from Omaha one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's just get Warren Buffett on the show. Why not? <laughs> yeah, if anybody knows Warren Buffett and you'd like to connect us, please do. Uh, Matt, that was really interesting, and um, you definitely shared some some good information there. And you mentioned a book that uh, Warren was a fan of. I know Kevin and I are both big readers, and I think a lot of successful people are, are there any books that you would recommend to someone who's interested in learning more about value investing? Yeah, I would just recommend the same book that Buffett recommends. So it's called The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. And he wrote it, I think, back in like 1932. So it's, it's, you know, just the same fundamental principles, but just the few first few chapters, I think, will really open the eyes to a lot of people because it talks about the difference between an active and a passive investor. And I think, you know, maybe egotistically or maybe it's just human nature, but I think a lot of people believe just as soon as they learn about money, that you know, they can out-compete and they can, you know, have a higher ROI than, than the market or, you know, they can find great deals and make tons of money. Um, but, uh, you know, long-term, it's like, uh, yeah, I just lost my train of thought there for a second because I just thought about something else. Uh, sorry, someone, someone, there's a door right here. Uh, so someone just walked by saying something. But um, Intel, we were talking about the intelligent investor and the first few chapters yeah, so are what you it, need to read. Yeah, it differentiates, it differentiates, differentiates right away between a active and passive investor. Long story short, active investor is someone who actively is going to spend time and energy every day, you know, weekly, monthly, yearly, studying and looking at, like you said earlier, uh, Kevin, not just the, the, the company and the, and the market segment, but the whole economy, the whole, like every equity piece that you can ever invest in. That's why Warren such a encyclopedia na- knowledge of, of every company out there. Because he always asks himself the question of, you know, what's my opportunity cost when I invest in Apple? Is there another company? that can produce a higher ROI with my 10 billion in cash. 
you know, and, and in his head, you know, the difference between a hundred dollars means a lot to him. So he's really thinking those questions through. Um, so yeah. And, uh, you mentioned earlier, just kind of joking around about, you know, does anyone know him? I mean, um, just without going into details, I used to work at a company that, you know, he was on the board. So I got to see him, you know, a couple times a year. Um, like ironically, like one of my favorite stories, I told Kevin this a while back, but it was like, we were getting, uh, our board was getting a tour of the floor and uh, I was watching the Tupperware for my lunch, trying to be all frugal, save a couple bucks, you know, get that investment fund going. And all of a sudden I hear, uh, I hear the, basically our, our chief marketing guy say, and here's the kitchen. I look over and it's like Warren and all these other billionaires. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> there's like, there's just wa- wa- like I'm just washing my Tupperware and it's like this giant wealth disparity. <laughs> wow. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean like, you know, at the end of the day, like I said, it's like looking at the numbers, uh, just even seeing him in person too, uh, it's hard to do, but it's just really looking at the black and white, you know, metrics is trying to avoid the flowery language from news reports, trying to avoid, you know, like tweets or or whatever. It's just looking at, you know, not even the quarterly earnings. It's really the, the annual progress. Okay. So from, you mentioned tweets and I'm I'm glad that you mentioned it. So from with that in mind i remember when elon musk he's all he's active on twitter and there was a a segment on the joe rogan podcast where he smoked weed and everybody was freaking out him being the ceo of a company if you are a value investor how do you look at something like that or like a pr scandal of some sort yeah i mean uh so if something like that happens Um, you know, yeah, with a lot of PR scandals over the years, I'm just thinking through, um, there was like the whale trade loss for JP Morgan, maybe back in 2012. I remember I bought in on that dip. That was a big one. Um, the Volkswagen, like emissions crisis, right? I mean, these are big fundamentally changing events to the company, but typically what happens is the market overreacts. So instead of taking the company down 25%, they take it down 35%. And, you know, it might not have been a, 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 you know, the best investment before, but again, going back to that cigar butt analogy, it becomes a lot more appealing to, Hey, you know what, let me try to ride this out. Um, So, you know, it's tough again, because sometimes uh, I'm thinking of one of my good buddies, uh, he tried to short Amazon because, you know, they weren't posting any earnings, right? So from a value investor standpoint, he's pretty accurate, right? He's just saying um, this company is profitable. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're and that, this was at a time when they were trading at like some hundred plus multiple, right? Um, but the thing was that, you know, everyone had a, enough faith in them to keep that price high enough at that hundred plus multiple because they knew five years from now it was going to be priced appropriately. And that's basically what happened. It never dipped. So he kept trying to short it. So even though like on a fundamental level, you look at the numbers, you're right. You have to still factor in the psychology of the market. And it's just, that's why value investing gets really complicated at the end of the day. Cause it's like, even if you find a gold mine, it gets tricky. You know? Yeah. So Matt, one of the things I was going to ask you about is your investing approach. And if it's very straightforward as in you buy these things and hold them and then decide to exit, but I'm glad you mentioned the word short there. Uh, and a lot of our listeners may not know what that means. So I guess it's kind of a two parter here, you know, first of all, could you give a little insight for those who may not know what a short is or a put, uh, and then, do you employ those types of strategies? It sounds like you might. I'll say, yeah, don't short anything ever. I'm anti shorting. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, Good deal. I'm more of a buy and hold type of guy. So, you know, in terms of the stocks I've, I've purchased, you know, I still have, let's see, I'll look back here. I got my first share, my first like Berkshire share, like Frank. Oh, cool. But like, you know, oh, cool. I, I just buy and hold it. And, um, you know, Berkshire was really more just to get those annual passes to go to, you know, the Woodstock, right? But um, so the, that was a stock certificate of Matt's first Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, for those of you who aren't watching this on YouTube, uh, we'll just let you know what he held up there. It's pretty cool looking. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
it costs a couple extra bucks to get them like printed out and whatnot, but I, I did it for like memorabilia of it, you know? Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, it's, uh, for, for me going back to the number one book I would recommend between that passive and active investor, you learn that right off the bat. And basically what it tells you is that if you're an active investor, go all in, you know, invest, put all your eggs in one, one basket and watch that basket with your eyes, like, you know, 24 seven. Don't spread your eggs across a hundred baskets. It, 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 like the principles of like diversification don't make sense in value investing, because if you truly found the value, based on you know the principle of uh, opportunity cost, you would put everything you have into it. And that's why Warren, if you look at his investment career over the years, many times, uh, especially like in the '70s and '60s, you know, he would be 40, 50 percent into just one stock. Um, which is pretty ballsy, right? You know, yeah. when, you're, when you're dealing with a lot of other people's money and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's where you have to have the courage of your convictions and really trust in your analysis. And, um, you know, in terms of what I believe is, yeah, the, you know, one of the greatest value investors we'll ever see, you know, he basically just looks at, like I said, the 10 Ks, the annual snapshots, tries to avoid the noise of the market, tries to avoid the daily ups and downs, what the Fed might do or, you know, how, uh, you know, he, he tries to just look at, um, like I said, those, those annual snapshots and, and that, that tells him a lot. So with value investing, uh, well, first of all, I want to ask, what's your exit? I know you say you buy and hold. Does that mean you're going to hold that stock, collect the dividends till you die? Is that really what the exit is? Well, uh, so following again with that passive and active investor. So the active investor would want to buy and hold um, at least eight to 10 years usually, because that's kind of the principle of this is that it takes a while for the market to catch up to your beliefs here, or at least it takes a while for the market to really uh, understand that intrinsic value like you do. Um, and sometimes, sure, it takes a lot you know, less time um, there's plenty of, you know, success cases out there um, that are much shorter, but typically it's a longer time frame. That's why you hear that quote from Warren, try to find a stock you're, you're willing to buy and you're also willing to just turn off the TV and turn off the, uh, you know, the radio and, and not hear anything for 10 years. Something that you're comfortable owning for 10 years and you don't have to look at it every day. You know, you, you don't have to look at that ticker. Um, so that's kind of like the, the approach to value investing. You want to find something you really believe in. Um, and if, if something were to change your opinion to sell right away within a month, then you, uh, you know, you, you're in and out, you're in and out. And that's, that's not really the principles of, of value investing. So Matt, what is the mindset of value investing? It's it's a it's a controversial one because you're essentially saying that the efficient market hypothesis is is, is incorrect, right? Interesting. Um, and so yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's a tough mindset. It's a kind of a contrarian mindset, um, but I don't want to confuse the two terms of a contrarian investor and a value investor. But I mean the mindset's really that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 plenty of of market opportunities still out there. Um, I think the efficient market hypothesis is sort of, um, you know, I think that gets people into a lot of index funds, and that kind of actually goes into the passive investor that the book talks about. And that's actually at the end of the day, it's, that's kind of what I do. I you know at the back of the at, you know in terms of my my cash flows for my investments, I, I pretty much just use an index fund with the rationale of I'd rather be investing in myself in terms of my time and energy and um, to look at one stock versus another stock. You know, if I, if I boost a 10% extra return, I'm starting off the low base. So it doesn't really make a big difference, but if I can learn a new skill set or, you know, launch a new product, that's going to, you know, that's going to drive up more than 10% on, you know, an investment. So um, in terms of, yeah, looking at it, uh, I, I'm more of a past investor, but if you're going to be an active investor, then yeah, it's, it's really for like the 1% of people. That's really what Warren's saying out there is like, you know, it's not for everybody. 
Um, and so if, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, Oh, you know, I'm just going to start reading some 10 Ks and, and just start reading about, um, you know, it, it's just, it's hard because uh, you're competing with algorithms nowadays. You're competing with these micro trading, you know, you know, it just, it's hard. So you have not only other value investors who are doing the legwork, but you also have computer algorithms to compete with as well. So that look for and scan for these ratios that I talked about earlier. Yeah. I'm glad so, you gave that out to our uh, listeners and, and made those last few comments. That's great. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, like Warren, another, another move. Uh, I mean, I follow a lot of investors, but I think a lot of people follow Warren. So I just go back to him, but he basically found like a price manipulation, in South Korea back in 06, 07, I want to say. And it was essentially just an old school arbitrage of just the currencies weren't trading um, correctly due to like a pending trade bill that was going to be passed, but it just due to like some sort of red tape, it was kind of delayed. And that delay kind of like spiked all the, all these prices kind of out of whack. And it's like that, that's what I mean by like Warren's looking at all these opportunities and something like that happens and he pours billions of dollars into, into South Korean companies, you know? So, so it's like, you know, that's, that's the, the, you know, that's, that's the kind of value investor he is. But, um, you know, thinking to other, some other ones, it's like, if you can just find one good company that, you know, um, especially a smaller company too, then you can actually maybe make a difference in terms of, you know, a hundred thousand dollar investment might actually get you a seat on the board. Um, you know, things like that. But, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's a big spectrum right there, a billion versus, yeah. uh, you know, whatever. And then, you know, but, uh, I, I wish I had a billion dollars just like, Oh, something's happening. I'm going to see what, see what, see how this plays out. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's one approach to investing and I think, uh, there's many approaches. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's hard to say if it's, you know, going to, you know, numerically you could look at it and say it was very effective for the. 20th century. Um, but you know, do, you know, uh, Bill Gross talked about this before his kind of downfall in the market in, in, I guess the media market, but like he talked about these different epochs in investing and he kind of says, we're kind of transitioning now into a new epoch and value investing no longer has the same appeal. Kind of same, what I was saying before with the introduction of more, you know, algorithmic trading, Sure. I think like now, like 96% of all volume is done electronically, automatically. So it's, wow. you know, it's hard to compete in that world. Um, and even if you're an active investor, you know, the, the, the theory is that you're going to outcompete the market due to your effort and energy and your intelligence. So it's not that you just find a lucky gem and you invest in it, you win. It's that you're, you know, you're, you're working for that ROI, but when you're competing against these big companies that have massive, you know, teams and, and, and giant, you know, uh, budgets for resources, it's hard to, to be an individual value investor nowadays. That makes sense. So the show is called tech guys who invest. And one of the things that Adam and I fully wholeheartedly believe in is investment of self. Uh, and, with that, we believe that once you kind of invest in yourself enough, you can, as you mentioned, add value in a bunch of uh, variety of ways, which is why you were talking about how you're a passive investor. What have been uh, some of the best ways that you've invested in yourself? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I can actually tie it back into that same book I was talking about because uh, some big principles came from that. But uh, if anyone gets it, you know, their hands on it, it's called, yeah, The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. And really the two chapters that Warren always recommends are chapter eight and 20 about Mr. Market and this principle of uh, the margin of safety. But when it comes to, um, you know, putting in, um, you know, your own investments of your own time, those two principles play a big factor, I think, in terms of uh, Mr. Market. So, you know, that, that's the principle of the market's going to go up and down. Mr. Market is this guy who kind of, in the story, is kind of like this drunk guy who comes in. Sometimes he's just a static, wants to party. Sometimes he's kind of like drunk down on his luck and he's just like depressed. And, you know, that, that's kind of the story of what the market's like. And you never know which way it's going to go in the day. Um, but 
if you look at, you know, things that are within your control, I would say, yeah, like definitely investing within yourself, certain skill sets you can learn, certain soft skills, especially, I think would just be, uh, you know, tremendous. Um, <clears throat> I would say, yeah, like, uh, you know, some people want to learn, you know, coding or there's so many resources now online in terms of online courses, online, you know, YouTube channels or sites that have um, quite a lot. So, you know, that, that, that field of self-education, I think, um, you know, for the few people that actually pursue it, you are going to have that competitive advantage. And that's sort of, you know, tying back to value investing, right? So it's like, how do you build up your own competitive durable advantage? Um, and then the last principle there was that margin of safety. So it's, it's like, if you're going to build a bridge for a $10,000 or 10,000 pound truck, you want to build the weight capacity to, to allow for 30,000 pounds. You don't want to, you know, build a bridge that allows for 10,000 to one pounds. Right. Um, so same kind of principles with kind of like your own investments of time and energy. So a quick analogy I did, you know, years ago was I started a podcast with someone who I didn't know was going to work out, but I, I viewed my investment of time and energy as, you know, even if it fails, it's going to be a huge, valuable learning experience. Um, and so you know, it's kind of applying that same principle there. So, you know, if you look at value investing from a standpoint of not just your own capital and money, but really your earning potential and your, you know, your, your future currency, right? Your, your capacity to earn more. Uh, and if the younger you are, the more powerful it is today to learn the right skills or um, to have the right mindset. So, um, for value investing, yeah, that's really taught me a lot towards um, investing in myself, for sure. Yeah, that's great. If any, if any, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that, that was good. Um, okay, uh, here is a non-investing question that we like to ask our guests because we're the tech guys who invest. So, you know, we have like a nerdy side to ourselves. And uh, we always find it interesting to find out what some of our guests like in terms of tech. Uh, so what's your favorite piece of tech? Uh, and it could be something that you're using right now or something that you currently like, or it could be something that you, uh, is just sort of an old favorite. <laughs> I got like, a, like a, I got like a weird hobby, but, uh, I, I one time kind of like dug into, uh, Elon Musk's whole thing about like, you know, the future of AI and like, you know, all these companies out there that are investing in like Google and Apple and, and you know, all these like Chinese companies. So I, I did some research and I basically like was like, okay, how do I learn more about this? But, but you know, not from like Hollywood and not from, <laughs> you know I mean, like how do I actually get to the source information? So I picked up this giant textbook. Oh my God. They teach, wow. they teach it like Stanford and all this, like it's written by like the head guy at Google and all this stuff. So in terms of tech nowadays, honestly, I think, you know, AI is like one of the biggest things. Um, and within AI, there's so many, you know, there's like machine learning, there's so many other components. So I think when you study AI, you can study a lot of different things. Um, so that's kind of like a random tech hobby that I got. And it's a pretty that's big awesome. one, but yeah, it's, um, it's something I look at because it also inspires me just to try to automate more, you know, in my own life and then sure. just try to be more efficient you know, going to my own brand here, it's like try to distill down, you know, my time and try to be more efficient and effective. Yeah, and for, that's cool. For those of you listening on the podcast, that book was thick, like <laughs> the size of a dictionary. Yeah, I don't understand most of it, but you know, <laughs> like I'll read, you know, a paragraph here and there, like the intro chapters just to get like some basic rudimentary understanding. And, and then it just dives into physics and like, you know, and I'm like, oh gosh. Wow. Uh, but just uh, know enough to be dangerous or safe when it comes to AI. <laughs> so Matt, our, yeah. our last question for you is where can people find you? Yeah, go to, I mean, uh, I blog over at distilleddollar.com and uh, I pretty much try to post every Friday, Entrepreneur Happy Hour. It's a great podcast. Uh, basically just talking about the, I focus on, um, you know, I kind of grew up in the investing, being frugal kind of blogger world, but then hitting CNBC, MSN, you know, all these big publications uh, back in 2017 now. That kind of got me all these requests for, hey, how do I do what you did and how do I make money online and all that stuff. So I sort of stumbled into that market. But 
but uh, yeah, now I, I focus mostly on membership sites. So um, yeah, check out the still dollar. There's tons of old content for like savings and investing uh, tons of stuff about Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, all these great value investors. Um, and uh, you know, it's funny. Yeah. We talked a lot about Warren, but funny enough, it's like his, his business partner I actually admire and, and, and like a lot more. <laughs> um, so, but like, you know, that's the depth of it all, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, check, uh, check out the dollar.com if, uh, and, uh, you know, right now, basically I'm just kind of throwing up like a free savings PDF that kind of talks a little bit about what you guys are talking about with like, at the end of the day, if you really want to save a lot more, you, you have to increase your earnings at the end of the day. And, you know, by investing in yourself, just, just time and energy, it's a frugal investment. Yeah, you're not wasting money. Um, and you know, the, the reward is remarkable for people that actually pursue it. Oh, that's awesome. And just real quick, Matt, what's the name of that PDF for people so they can find it? Uh, oh, geez. Uh, I think it's like 17 frugal strategies we use to save 50 K. Okay. So it was kind of like a big blog post we did. Uh, we, we basically say me, my wife and I, we save 50 K over a year. And so I kind of detailed the 17 little things and, it's everything from, you know, ironing my shirts that save $200 to, you know, not going to the movie theaters that save. So I kind of add them all up over time. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, so that's the, the PDF that, that kind of gives some good, 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 I think great classic, you know, timeless tips. We'll put a link to that PDF in the show notes. Matt, once again, thanks so much for coming on, adding value to our listeners. We really enjoyed having you. Yeah, it was awesome. And I appreciate you guys having me on and uh, hope to talk soon. I hope you guys can uh, maybe even take some time to, you know, be on our, uh, my show in a, in a little bit here. We'd Great. love that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Matt. That's it for this episode of Tech Guys Who Invest. This is Adam. And this is Kevin. Thank you so much for listening to us. Don't forget to join our Facebook page where we're building a community of investors so that we can share ideas, tips and other ways to help us get out of the rat race if you found value in this podcast it would mean the world to us if you could share it with your network lastly we love feedback it's how we get better so if you wouldn't mind spending 30 seconds and leaving us an honest review on itunes or stitcher or whatever platform you're using that would be super sweet if you want to get on adam or kevin's calendar go to tgwipodcast.com slash contact we want to help you invest safely wisely and ultimately get you out of the rat race. Thanks again.